Anna, Anna, can you hear me? I see her twitch every time I call her name, but she doesn't seem bothered enough to answer. I can see new scars on her hands, and her eyes won't move from the cuts and the scratches that she has on her wrists. Anna, I try again. This is the fourth appointment we had that you seem uncooperative, and you know what this means. I mean that she has to go to isolation again. She hates it there, and the moment she hears that word, her eyes drift away from her hands and onto my eyes. Her stare feels invasive in some way, but I've dealt with so many patients before, I'm starting to get used to their eyes. It's always their eyes that freak people out here. Some of them seem so full of hatred and feelings that they can't control, and some of them so empty. I don't want you to go there either, but you leave us with no choice. You can't heal if you won't talk to me, I say, and I sit next to her. What's left to say? You never believe me anyway, she says and looks away. She seems like she's feeling guilty of something. Why don't we start with your hands? I noticed there's some new cuts there. I thought we talked about that, and you were willing to try the alternative methods to cutting I told you about. I'm telling you, I didn't do this. She almost yelled this time. I can't talk to you if you won't believe me, you moron. Fine, fine. Why don't you tell me again who did this to you? I ask her as I get up and sit on my chair across from her. I like to notice her when she says her story. It makes me understand if she believes she's telling the truth and what part is the hardest for her. I always notice that she starts off okay, but when she gets to the last part, she seems at edge, and she even starts to yell. There were even a couple of times that we had to sedate her, unfortunately. I told you, it's him. It's that shadow. He's everywhere, she says and looks down. She always has that look when she refers to him. It's like she knows that what she says sounds off, but she believes it, and she wants me to believe her too. Is he here, right now? Is this shadow with us now? I ask her. He's always here. Don't you get it? He's fucking with my mind. It started with something stupid, like I'd wake up in the middle of the night by loud duds on the window, and at first, I thought it was the branches from the trees, because it was windy. But it kept going on, even when there was no wind to cause that. He'd keep me up at night, and I'd hear him whisper outside my window. At first, I could only make out words like cut, and blood, and please. But he soon started to yell at me to let him in. I couldn't make him shut up. He's fucking talking to me all the time, and his rotten mouth won't close. I tried everything I could to make him go away, but no one would believe me. He would whisper every night all the things he wanted to do to me. He said that he wanted to cut me open and eat my intestines. He loved the taste of blood, and he wanted to paint my bedroom walls with that. He said that he was a true artist. He wouldn't shut up about it. Every night, he'd wake up at 3 or 3 in the morning, and he'd whisper to me with his vile voice, and then he'd yell and beg to let me in. He said he wanted to touch me. He said he wanted to play with me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I told him to come in. His every touch would burn my skin. I could even smell it. I'd feel my skin blister as he touched me and made me crawl for him. His sharp nails would dig into my skin, and the blood would drip on the floor, and he'd make me lick it. I yelled and cried as he laughed and laughed, and told me that I would never escape, because he was a shadow. He was my shadow. He still won't shut up, and his words are scratching my brain, and I have to let them out. She was starting to seem panicky and at edge now, and her eyes were red. She was trying to hold back the tears. Anna, that's enough for today. We can meet at Thursday again if you're well enough for another time. I said, but she wouldn't listen. He wanted to get inside me, he said. He wanted to make more out of him. I felt him inside me. Every night, I felt his evilness filling me up. I knew there was no turning back. It would grow bigger and bigger. 
she pointed at her stomach. And I could feel something evil kick and bite my insides. I felt razor sharp nails scratching my skin. I would feel sick all the time. More shadows into this world. That's what he wanted, and I had to kill them. Don't you see? I couldn't let another shadow come to life. So one night, as he was sleeping next to me, I reached for his knife, and I cut it open. Just like I thought, there was something evil inside of me. It looked like a monster. It was pink and covered in blood. Something disgusting. He didn't like it. He wanted to have more evil shadows, so he hit me, but I slit his throat. I hit him before he managed to get up, and I slit his throat. He was bleeding and cursing. That pig. I was covered in blood. There was so much blood. So much blood. She was starting to yell the last sentence over and over, and I knew that she couldn't continue the session. She was anxious, and she was biting whatever was left of her nails. But I had to ask some final questions. She had never gone this far with her story. Anna, what happened to the shadow? There was so much blood, and he painted himself red and got inside me. He's everywhere. He's inside my skin. He's inside my head, my thoughts. He's there when I look in the mirror. He's all I see. What do you see when you look at the mirror? Do you see yourself? I asked and pushed the button for the nurse to come in and take her. I knew that soon she would want to return to her room. I only see a shadow. I don't see Anna anymore. He won't let me remember her anymore. His words burn and his voice itches my skin. I have to let him out now. I have to let him go. There was so much blood. She said one last time. She looked at her mutilated arms and started scratching her hands again. I nodded to the nurse to take her back to her room and told her to restrain her tonight. Anna has been my patient for a year now, and her case is one of the hardest ones. She came to us after she escaped. She had been abducted when she was 14, and she was held captive for three years where she was repeatedly raped until she could have a baby. Once she got pregnant, she cut herself open, removed the fetus, and then she killed the guy who abducted her. She always says the same story, and I think that now she truly believes it. She really believes that she was taken by a monster, and unfortunately, her recovery doesn't seem hopeful. Also, just to be clear, many people believe that the isolation room I mentioned is somehow a prison isolation. Our facility has isolation rooms that our patients can draw or write, and they can express their emotions in that kind of way. Also, the isolation room is really helping our patients, and let's just say that it was my creation. I'm going to do whatever it takes to help them get better. Anna doesn't like it there because the only person she really likes is her roommate Stella, who really is no help for Anna, and their relationship is somewhat turning toxic. But more on that and the isolation room in a different video. Also, I see Anna twice a week. This was our fourth appointment where she seemed uncooperative to talk. She was doing a little better, but she seems to feel not very well lately. Hey Adam, how are you feeling today? I ask him as he sits down. I'm... I'm okay, I guess. He stutters, and I know he's lying. He seems like he hasn't slept in ages, and he looks as pale as a ghost, although I know he's getting his vitamins. You don't look so well, Adam. Do you want to tell me what's wrong? Is there a problem with the medication you're receiving? It makes me dizzy, and it tastes awful, Doc, he says, and continues to chew his nails. It's getting worse and worse, unfortunately and it's difficult for him to stop now. Well, it is a new medication, Adam. You may just need some time to adjust. Now, the nurse has told me that you're having nightmares again. He looks down as I ask him about his nightmares. I know he feels ashamed that it won't stop, and I feel terrible for not being able to make them stop. No matter what we've tried, he won't sleep peacefully. 
but we have a long road ahead of us. It's not my fault, Doc. You know that. I'm trying. I really am, but he won't leave me alone. He's everywhere. When I open my eyes, he, he's sitting across from me. He won't stop looking at me, and I can't sleep when someone's looking at me. You know that. I can't sleep because he keeps looking at me, Doc. He looks a little agitated now, but unfortunately, that's the thing with Adam. Imagine someone who was high on cocaine and is now coming down from that high. That's how he is. He's always anxious, always looking behind his back and always chews on his fingers and nails. A few days ago, it got so bad that he needed stitches. Not a lot, but still. I'm still not sure if he wants to hurt himself or he's just too anxious and nervous all the time that's causing him to act like that. There's still so much more I need to find out about him. I'm wondering if I'll have to try out on him some of my new methods. I know it's not your fault, Adam. It's okay. If this new drug doesn't work, we can always try something else. But I want you to feel safe here. That's very important, isn't it? Doc, you know I can't feel safe here. I'm not safe. I'm not safe anywhere. He's following me. You know that. These things, that's what they do. They follow you and they want to collect what's theirs. They come in the night to take you and they're going to take me too. Oh, I was such a fool for doing this. I was such a fool for giving in. He starts to tap his foot on the ground now and his breathing is getting a little heavy. Every time he thinks about the deal, he gets like this. His face has turned red now and he won't look me in the eye. I'm such an idiot just wanted my family back, he mutters. Why do you believe that he still follows you? I ask him and sip on my coffee. I don't know. I haven't given him enough, maybe. I don't know what else to give him. I don't know what else to do. I just wanted my family back, you know. After that accident, I just wanted my life back. I can't forget that day. I was the one who convinced my parents to go to that stupid picnic. You know that. If I hadn't done that, maybe they'd still be alive. Maybe they would all be alive. I keep playing this image in my head. Doc, my head feels like a broken TV that will show the same thing on repeat. I keep seeing my mum's head cracked open, and there's so much blood. There's something missing from her. She's not whole. And my dad? I tried to hold his head down on his neck so he wouldn't bleed more, but it felt like I was drowning from all that blood. And his head wouldn't stay in place, Doc. And I couldn't put it back on. I tried. I really did. I tried to save them all, but I could barely breathe and I just felt down. I just wanted to make them come back, Doc. I wanted to correct the mistakes I had done. He started rocking back and forth on his chair, muttering. I just wanted to save them. I let him calm a bit and told him to take a few breaths and offered him some water before I continued. Adam... We both know that there's nothing you could have done, and it's not your fault. And I know that you keep thinking that your parents blame you, but I promise you that they're not. But they told me that they were disappointed in me. They blamed me, Doc. After I brought them back, they blamed me. I know we've talked about the deal you've made, but how exactly did it happen? After their death, I was heartbroken. I dropped out of high school. I began drinking heavily, and well, I drifted away from a lot of my friends. I started hanging out in a bar named Black Eye that was near my house, and I kind of made it my home, really. I met a lot of good people there. One night, I was drunk as hell, and I got a little emotional. I got approached by a guy named Malcolm. He paused and took a sip of his water. No, no his name was Malcolm. He said that he overheard me talking to myself about how I wanted my family back, and he asked me what I was willing to do. Like I said, I was pissed drunk, Doc, and I thought he was talking bullshit, so I did the favor of answering him. I told him that I'd do anything, and so I did. He whispered in my ear to follow him outside, and I said, what the hell, why not? And that was the biggest mistake, Doc. It was my biggest mistake was such a fool, Doc. I shouldn't have trusted him. He told me that it wasn't safe for us to talk about that kind of stuff inside the club, 
and he said that if I wanted to see my family again, I should follow him. He asked if I had something that belonged to them, and I remembered that I had a photo of them in my wallet. He took it. We got inside his car and drove to the woods. He cut my hand a bit and let my blood drip on the grass, and then he did the same thing. We mixed our bloods, let them drip on the photo, and started speaking in a language I've never heard before. Next thing I know, I'm waking up in my house and my mother is standing next to me. Just like that? I asked him. Later that day, I was told what had happened, Doc. He came back. That man with his big black eyes came back to talk to me. He was tall, brown hair and brown eyes. His voice was charming, but his words were scary. I thought you said that the man who had been following you had red eyes. His eyes were red now because he wants blood. Sometimes his whole figure turns red, like the color of blood, Doc. Deep red. And sometimes his nails are sharp and long. Dripping of blood. He says that's the blood that he's collected over the years. I see. What did the man tell you when he came to see you? And what about your family? How did it feel seeing them again? I felt a little uneasy. As time went by, though, his posture seemed to change a bit. He started feeling a little bit more at ease, I guess. But still, the look on his face, it bothered me. It looks odd. Adam is new here, and I've never heard the whole story. I just knew that he had lost his family when he was 18, and then, well, then things got bad. He said that he had given my family back, but nothing was given to humans for free. He told me that he'd come to collect my soul after seven years, and if I didn't give my life to him, he'd take someone else that was close to me. I thought that I was in a dream of some sort, Doc. I mean... Who would have believed this, right? But it was true, Doc. I swear, my family was right there. I could see them. I could touch them. I felt so happy when I saw them. I cried and hugged them, but they didn't seem normal, you know? They looked cold, Doc. They didn't want to hug me anymore. I screamed to that man to make them better. I told him that I'd do anything to get them back like they used to be, but he shrugged and told me that I wanted too much. He said that everything comes with a price, Oh, how much I've paid for my mistakes, Doc. I've paid with blood and pain, but he still wants more. He wants to squeeze the life out of me, but there's not much life left anymore. I feel as empty as my mother's gaze. That cold look she gave me every time I told her that I loved her. She told me that I was to blame for her death, and she told me how painful and agonizing it was for her to die. All the wounds she suffered, all this pain because of me... But I couldn't let them go. No, I couldn't let them go at that time. I just had to have them. I was greedy, wasn't I? He had a very unsettling look on his face. Like he was grinning in some way. I thought that I knew what was wrong with him. But as time goes by, Adam keeps revealing more and more. I don't really believe in the paranormal. But still, his story makes me feel a little disturbed. I didn't believe the guy at first. I didn't believe he could really hurt me, so I tried to forget all about him. I hid my parents in the house, and when I met my girlfriend, Sarah, I told her that they were dead. Well, I, I guess in some way they were, but, but still, it felt good to see their face again. They looked different, almost frail and too thin, but I was glad to have my family back. I was lost without them. I know that many people would have done the same thing, right, Doc? You would have wanted your family back too. If you've ever lost anyone you really love, then you know what I'm talking about, Doc, don't you? I nodded in agreement. I understand that it's hard for you, Adam. I can only imagine what you went through. No one can. Neither could Sarah. She was nice. She let me have all the time I wanted. She wasn't pushy and all that, Doc. I liked her. Pretty face and charming smile but then he came back he said that it had been seven years and that he had come back to take me i was finally happy i had everything i always wanted and he wanted to take me i refused to follow him but he said that if i didn't he would kill me in the most horrible way i was scared i didn't want to die doc i was so scared i told him to take someone else instead of me I told him that I only cared for my parents. 
I know, what a terrible thing to say, but I didn't think of Sarah at the time. I don't know why. I was frozen. He agreed, but said that my time would come soon. He would never leave me alone. He said that in time, I'd pay my debt no matter what. Oh, how I wish I could have mentioned Sarah, Doc. I was such a fool. I woke up the next morning and she was missing. No one can find her, Doc, and I don't know what to do. He whispers to me that he's taken her, Doc. He whispers to me all the horrible things he's doing to her, and I can't make him stop. I told him that it wasn't our deal, but he says that that's what he does. He tricks people. Do you believe that there's something that we could do to make him go away? I looked at him, and he had that same grin he had when they brought him in. It makes me think of how honest and true his words are. He almost seems believable, but it's not easy to tell yet. I don't know, Doc. I don't know. I can't stand listening to all the things he does to Sarah. And I blame myself, Doc. You know I blame myself. There's no one else to blame, is there? If it wasn't for my ignorance, they would be alive. But I have no one here with me, and that liar piece of shit that has taken everything away from me, he's the reason I'm in this place, isn't he? You have to make him go away, Doc. He's scratching my skin every night. He bites my hands. He mocks me, telling me it's just foreplay. The worst is yet to come. I feel it circling me, Doc. Death. Pain. He's everything. And he's everywhere, Doc. He says he'll torment my body and my soul for thousands of years. I try to fight him, but every time I try to seem brave, he laughs at me, Doc. He laughs at me. Every night, I try to close my eyes. I feel his sharp nails piercing my flesh. And I feel him in my mind, you know, all his evilness and all his vile words. I see them. I see his words, carved in my mind, just like my mother's haunting words of how she blamed me. His stinging stare reminds me of my father's gaze. He looked so disappointed. Or maybe it was hatred. Sometimes they were nice, you know, Doc, but mostly they were empty and cold. I did what every son would do. But nothing is enough anymore. Do you think that the torment I will go through when he takes my body and soul, do you think it'll be enough to repent for my sins? We talked a little bit more, and then he went to have his lunch. Adam is troubling me because his case is very odd. He believes that his father was driving at the accident, but the police have informed us that Adam was the one who was driving, and he was intoxicated. Also, people close to him told the police that Adam wasn't very good to his parents. Or probably, I guess, it could have been the other way around. His parents were overprotective, always forbidding him from going out and such. A friend of his told the police that he had a problem with alcohol and drugs, nothing heavy though, and his parents wanted him to go to rehab, but Adam wouldn't have it. It's strange that his parents died this way and I want to get to the bottom of this. There's something else that's been bothering me, though. His girlfriend Sarah is missing indeed, and no one knows what's happened to her. The police say that she was last seen with a friend who reported her missing. They were out in a bar when Sarah went to the bathroom and never came back. Adam's alibi does check out, but it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, if things with Adam don't work out soon and his nightmares get worse and worse, I think I'm going to call my friend Alex and ask him to help me with a new procedure I've always wanted to try. I think I'm going to take Adam into my secret room and see how it goes. Good afternoon, Olivia. How are you feeling today? I asked her and gestured her to sit down. I'm... I'm okay, I guess. She looked far from okay. She looked pale and like she hadn't eaten anything in weeks. I noted that she also might be anorexic from the look of her. You seem a little shaky, Olivia. Maybe a little sick too. Uh, are you feeling okay? Do you, do you think you're adjusting well here? I asked her and offered her some water. I'm okay. I'm not sick. It's just that my my visions are coming back, she said, and her lashes fluttered. It was like she was having trouble admitting it. 
I am sorry to hear that, Olivia, I said, and she rolled her eyes. Olivia, I really am. I know that in our first appointment, you talked about these visions a little bit, but I'd like you to tell me more about your story. I smiled. I want you to trust me. It was our third meeting, and I'd like to find out more about her and why she was here. We only knew a little when she came to us. Right, right, my story. I should start at the beginning then. My mother was ill. She was here. You know that, right? She was my patient. Your mother was a lovely woman, Olivia, and I'm terribly sorry for what happened to her. I want you to know that your father did everything he could to save her. She was good and kind. She was good and fucking kind, she scoffed. I fucking know that. She raised me. She was... She didn't deserve what happened to her, she said, and her expression hardened. Of course not. Fuck it. Anyway, after she got ill, I experimented with drugs and, well, I was drunk most of the time. I was completely alone at it anyway. My father was too depressed to do anything and my brother was hiding in his new life. He was too busy screwing his new girlfriend and all, so I had to deal with this. After she died, things were bad for me. I cut myself a lot, and I got wasted at any chance I was given. Finally, a friend noticed my cuts and wanted me to get into the hospital or whatever. I wouldn't have it though, and I told her that I needed some time off to relax my mind. So she suggested that we go to her lake house. And so we did. Me, Noelle, and her boyfriend Mark... We were supposed to stay for almost a month or so. The first few nights, they were okay I guess. I just had some weird nightmares but I was used to the damn things anyway so I brushed it off as nothing. What kind of nightmares? Things like the lake calling my name and when I'd go there my mother would drag me to the bottom to drown me. Creepy shit like that. <sighs> nothing would prepare me for what the hell happened there though. One night, I was awake when I felt something calling for me from the ghastly lake. I felt like I had to go there and I couldn't say no to the calling. Once I got in that lake, I felt an invisible force pulling me down and I couldn't move. I was petrified and it felt like I had woken up right there. I was unable to move. It was like the waves were holding me and there was no way I could get out of them. And then... I saw her. Her face reddened and she looked at me. Her face looked distorted in some way and her eyes were yellow. She she looked like a monster. Look, I know I sound crazy, obviously, but I swear I wasn't high. I, I saw that thing, like I see you right now. It felt like she wanted to hurt me. She grabbed at me with her hands and I felt her reaching in my insides and tearing them apart. I could feel my body ache like never before. She was in every cell of my body, burning me from the inside out. Next thing I know, Noelle was pulling me out of the water and I was coughing up water like crazy. My friends told me to rest then, but I couldn't get this out of my mind. I told them that there was something in the water. I told them that I felt it following me. It was inside our house now. They didn't believe me, even though I begged them to, and I told them to get the hell out of there. The house felt different then. It smelled of rotten fish and mold. I'd look in a direction and suddenly I'd see the walls turning red. No one else was seeing it though, and every time I tried to close my eyes, I'd get these sick visions. And then it started happening, even with my eyes open. I'd see myself gutting Noelle in her sleep and bathing in her blood. She paused and took a breath. I'm, I'm sorry, Olivia. I know this is hard for you. Take your time. I, I believe that by telling me this, you'll feel better. You need to talk to someone, and I'm always here for you. I glanced at her, waiting for the next part of her story. Again, I don't believe in the paranormal, but her story was very interesting and I wanted to get to the bottom of it so I could help her properly. 
You're right. I've never said those things to anyone. I saw visions of me peeling Noelle's skin off while she was still alive, and then I was wearing her skin. It was disturbing, to say the least. Shit, she muttered. I could see myself slowly peeling off her skin, and I was laughing at her agony. I was giggling as she was crying and telling me to stop. I'd see myself burning Mark alive. Messed up stuff really, but they felt so fucking real. I thought I was losing it. And then things got worse. What happened? I don't remember things clearly because it felt like I was watching my own body doing and saying these things, but I didn't do that. I felt like I was trapped in my own body, confined and unable to act different than what the entity did. I heard myself speaking these words, and I saw the blood on my hands, but it wasn't me. I couldn't have done that. She glanced up to the ceiling, and then at me, and continued. I... I killed a cat that was there, and my friends found me eating the poor thing. And then I screamed at them all of these horrible things telling them how terrible they had been to me when all they tried to do was help me. But I didn't say those things. It was it was my voice, but it wasn't me. They got me into the shower, and I remember I started feeling a heart-wrenching pain, and there was blood coming from my head, and I could feel the taste of it on my mouth. Her lip quivered, and she swallowed. I could see that saying these things were really difficult for her. I could see the scars on her, but hearing how she got them, it's a different thing. I broke a mirror, and I tried to cut Mark's leg while he was asleep. I tried to cut his tongue out too. I... this this thing inside of me, it, it did this. Then I saw myself in the mirror, and I saw my hand moving, grabbing a blade and slowly cutting away some skin from my forehead. I couldn't feel any pain. I couldn't feel anything. I saw my reflection in the mirror having a twisted smile on her face, but it wasn't me. I could feel all the blood dripping on my face and on my hands, but I couldn't stop. It was already pretty late by the time Noelle got to me. I woke up in a hospital with Noelle sitting next to me. She... she was missing. Three fingers. She said I did this to her, and I screamed at her with a weird voice that I wanted to burn her alive, and that I would kill all of them. And then you escaped the hospital? I asked. Yes. I stayed in a motel for a few days, but it followed me there. It was inside of me. I knew that no matter what, I had to destroy it before it destroyed me more. My whole body ached, but I couldn't go back. They think I was crazy. Who would believe me, right? <sighs> Fuck. I would look at myself in the mirror and I'd see my eyes turning yellow from blue. I'd see myself taking my own eyes out. And then I'd had to go do what I thought was my only option. You have to understand, this, this thing, once it's inside you, it can never die unless you do. There's nothing you can do to change it. The only thing that would set me free was to purify myself. Did that thing leave your body eventually? I thought so. I thought so at first, but when I was in hospital, I kept seeing it. I kept seeing it, standing in front of me, skin messed up, covered in burns and blood dripping from it. It's everywhere I look. It looks like it's me, but it's that thing... It's inside of me. It's evil. It whispers to me all kinds of terrible things. Things I could never do, but I find myself fantasizing about them. Do you see anything now, Olivia? Is this thing talking to you right now? A muscle in her jaw twitched, and then she said, I see myself sticking a thousand needles in your eyes. A smile formed on her lips. My worst fear is needles. I can't stand them. How the hell did she know that? Did, did she scare you? No, 
No reason for it anyway. I gave her a half smile and took a sip of my coffee. I don't know why I'm in here, you know. My stupid brother thought for some messed up, ridiculous reason that it was a good thing. I'm not crazy. That thing that got inside me that night in the lake is evil, and it's real, just as we are. It won't stop until I do what it wants me to do, you know? Nothing will work anymore. It's... it's inside me. Olivia is a new patient here. Her brother and father are friends with my father, who owns this place by the way, and we accepted her here. It's a hard case, as you can understand, but I'm willing to try everything I can. I know that many of you believe in the paranormal, and I know that in many religions, schizophrenia or any kind of mental illness with these symptoms and traits are called possessions, but I'm more of a science man. I hope that, in time, we can find the best treatment for that poor thing and save her. She's been here for a week and she's already attacked three nurses, screaming bloody murder and telling them how she wanted to tear them apart and eat their soul. They all sweared that her voice didn't sound human in any way. One of them had to get stitches on her face. Poor Mary. So, I need to give a quick update about something. Um, apparently, Noelle is missing. Her things were left untouched at her place, and apparently, there was blood on the floor in a cracked bottle, and no one can seem to locate her. Hello, Dr. S, Mary said and sat on the leather chair. Her eyes were red like she'd been crying, and she couldn't look into my eyes. Mary has always been very sensitive, and the smallest of things could upset her, but I felt like there was something bad going on. Good morning, Mary, I said and poured myself some fresh coffee. Are you feeling okay today? I'm having a terrible headache, she rubbed her head. It must be the weather or something. Doctor, can my sister join us today? She asked, looking at the door. She she says she wants to talk to you. Uh, sure, okay, I replied, a little surprised. Effie was never eager to talk to me. And to be honest, she has a bit of an attitude and it's always been hard for her to open up to anyone. Can I have some coffee too, Doc? Effie asked with her heavy voice. She looked at me with her stony eyes. Her look always felt invasive, even unsettling sometimes. Sure. Uh, Effie, Mary told me that you wanted to speak to me. Yeah, Dr. S. It's been a long time. So, Mary told me that poor mummy wants to meet up with us. Is that correct? She replied with a thick voice. Only if you want to. Well, I don't want to see that fucking bitch, she said with a tight-lipped smile. What about Mary then? I think she would like to see her mother. Mary tried to answer, but Effie cut her off. I said no. Effie seemed taut now. I could see that Mary wanted to meet her mother. She has admitted to me numerous times that she has missed her. Effie, I think I want to see mummy. Mary finally spoke. Your sister is entitled to her opinion, Effie. I intervened. No one asked you, Dr. S. What does it stand for, Dr. Stupid? She mocked. There's no need to speak like this. You know you're upsetting your sister, I said. Like I mentioned, Mary is very sensitive, and the slightest upheaval would make her want to hurt herself. Quiet! She shrieked. And you, you fool, you stupid girl... How can you talk back to me and question my decisions after everything I've done for you? Did you forget, little sister? All the nights he crawled into your bed? All the times he tied your limbs like a savage and made you bent over for him? Do you remember how he laughed at your cries and how he mocked your pain? Did you forget how much he loved to make you scream? Did you forget? She said in a brittle voice. How can I forget when all I see in the mirror are the scars he left me with? She sobbed. Mary, I've tried to protect you forever. You're so weak, she yelled. She has destroyed our lives. That poor excuse of a woman and her bastard husband. You want to see her? Effie, it's her choice, not yours, if she wants to. Her choice? She interrupted me. 
I have to hear her cries every night, Dr. S. Not you. She looked jittery. When they came here, Mary was always the sweetest one. But Effie wasn't like that. She wasn't mean and she wasn't cruel or at least not like that. She was tougher, but it feels like over the years this place has taken something from her. Her eyes seemed hollow and empty. I wonder what she had to do in order to protect her sister. I wonder what it takes to become Effie. Although Mary could be hard to handle or to calm down in her worst of days, Effie is unfortunately worse. I honestly have tried to help them and I'll never stop but I think that nothing anyone ever does can fix what has been broken. The pain and suffering they have endured in the hands of their deluded family was too much for someone to handle. It breaks my heart to see cases like this. It wouldn't take long to figure that they have been through hell after you've laid eyes on them. Their bodies are scarred to the bone and the burning marks are still very visible. Effie, please stop, Mary begged. Mum suffered the same way as we did. She could have helped us. Hell, she could have helped herself, Effie hissed. But life is not for the weak, Mary. Effie, I think Mary is right. You don't have to see her if you don't want to, and you don't have to be present in their meeting, I suggested. Let her see her mother. How can you say that? She snapped. You weren't there when his friends took turns to fuck her, she yelled. Mummy knew. Mummy watched. No, doctor, you weren't there. But oh, I bet you'd love that doctor, she said in a coy manner. I bet you imagine what it feels like to touch her breasts, haven't you, you naughty, naughty boy? I bet young girls turn you on, doc, she winked. Effie, please stop this, I said firmly. This was starting to get uncomfortable, and obviously, I wanted this conversation over. She has never said anything like this before. What's wrong, Dr. S? Effie tried to sound almost seductive. Oh, come on. I know you want to taste her, yes? Would you go rough on her like the others did? You sick fuck. I see the way you look at her, you little pig man. She was frantic now. Like when they burned us and marked us as their own and let us bleed while they screamed that it was God's will. Like they fucked little crying baby Mary when she could barely walk and carved all those symbols on her chest while they chanted. Do you remember little sister when they made you slit that piggy's throat while he cried in pain and they bathed you in his blood? What was his name? Pinky. Do you remember sister? She was delirious now and her body had stiffened and she looked in my eyes. I felt her gaze piercing me, and I tried to look away. Oh, doctor seems to be enjoying this, she exclaimed. I bet you touch yourself at night with this stuff, doctor. Effie, that's enough. Stop. I need to talk to Mary, I said, and tried to remain calm. Oh, but doctor, you must know. I must tell you what happened to little sister. I must tell you. Life is not like the porn movies you watch. It's cruel, and it's messed up. You cannot recover from that. I cannot silence the voices and moans they made up as they were tearing me apart, but I can silence Mary's. She laughed. I can do that, yes. Effie, you have to stop this. I know there's nothing I can do to change what has happened to you, but we can make things better. Mary and I have gone so far. I promise to help her. Save it, doctor. I don't trust men. You're not doing your job, little pig man. I know all about your secret room and your father. You're a sick puppy. It runs in the family, doesn't it? Family can mess you up. I think we can agree on that one. I looked at her, stunned. How could she know? She laughed in an unsettling way that made the hair on my spine rise, and I could feel her black eyes glued on me. (laughs) We are the same, you and I, she whispered. Effie, I need to talk to Mary now, I begged. Don't you get it? There's no Mary anymore, Doctor. She's gone. I tried to talk to her, but she simply got up and left. It wasn't the first time that Mary's second personality had done that. Although it's not very usual, I have seen various cases of multiple personality disorder where the patient has been lost inside the second personality, 
Usually the other personalities are more domineering and can affect in a great way their behavior. When Mary came to us four years ago, she was in a terrible state. She was born inside a satanic cult by a mother that had been abducted and used only to breed. The poor woman was kept in the same conditions as Mary. Mary had to give birth at the mere age of 12. From what the police told me, she has given birth to three babies. She was raped and horribly abused since she was an infant. Finally, when she was 14, police barged inside the place the cult members lived and caught them all. Little Mary had created Effie since she was a kid. Many kids who go through abuse can't handle it on their own and their mind creates someone else, someone who protects them from all the pain they go through. Switching to another personality can take minutes or days. There's no way to predict this, but in Mary's case, Mary thought of Effie like a big sister. She was often seen to talk to her and always mentioned Effie as her sister. Whatever we gave Mary, we always had to bring an extra one for Effie too. But for some reason, I still can't understand, Mary still believes that she's 14. She's 14.